I speak to you this day in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Every Saturday morning in the late 1970s, my brother Robert and I would wake up at 6.45 a.m. and stumble sleepy-eyed to the big cabinet television set in my dad's study. We'd turn on one of the three channels we could get in Paragould, ABC out of Jonesboro, CBS out of Memphis, or NBC right here out of Little Rock, but the screen would be filled with that static we used to call snow because none of those channels would start broadcasting on Saturday morning until 7 a.m. Do you remember that? Well, Robert and I would sit expectantly in our pajamas until at the top of the hour, the Hall of Justice would appear and the first Saturday cartoon, Super Friends, began. Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman would soon be followed by Bugs Bunny or Scooby-Doo, and Robert and I would sit mesmerized in front of that television until lunchtime when cartoons were replaced by either professional wrestling or an old Johnny Weissmuller Tarzan movie. And as much as I love that weekly dose of cartoons, my favorite part of Saturday mornings happened in between the shows when the TV producers subversively decided to teach us something about grammar or outer space or how a bill becomes a law. If you're near my age, you know that I'm talking about that series of cartoon short films known as Schoolhouse Rock. They included Conjunction Junction. Lolly, get your adverbs here and Interplanet Janet, and of course, I'm just a Bill. But my favorite Schoolhouse Rock episode was different from all the others. Whereas they were upbeat and toe-tapping, it was thoughtful and quiet, as if it were inviting grade school children to plumb deeply into its subject. And its name, three is a magic number. The opening lyrics were, three, it's a magic number. Yes, it is. It's a magic number. Isn't that groovy? <laughs> 1978. Now that's as much as I remembered, but as I was preparing for today's sermon, I got on YouTube, pulled it up, and listened to it all over again. And to my surprise, the next line in this mass-produced Saturday morning network cartoon is this. Somewhere in the ancient mystic trinity, you get three. There's a magic number. The past, the present, and the future. Faith, hope, and charity. The heart and the brain and the body give you three. You pull out your service leaflet, please, and look on the front real quick, because I'm sure you all marked your calendars that today is Trinity Sunday. <laughs> this is the day when the preacher is tasked to explain to you in 13 and a half minutes the doctrine of the Trinity. This is generally considered by priests to be the most undesirable preaching date on the entire calendar. Now I had looked up Schoolhouse Rock because I thought it might give me a nice gimmicky launching point for today's homily. But instead, I sat at my computer stupefied for a moment, realizing that way back in 1978, Schoolhouse Rock truly had attempted to teach us something about the nature of God. And then I remembered, and this is true, that one of the creators of Schoolhouse Rock is Jay Sidebotham, who later became an Episcopal priest Wonder of wonders. So how is it that one God, 
is also three. Why is it important in the contemporary world to even maintain such a perplexing doctrine? The other major monotheistic faiths, Judaism and Islam, as well as that Christian offshoot known as Unitarianism, they all find our Trinitarian notion of God problematic. They say that deep down, we aren't monotheists at all, that we're asserting three gods in place of one. But it isn't so. In fact, most of the explanations of the Trinity that we've discarded over the past two millennia have been declared heretical exactly because they skirted too close to polytheism. The church has always ultimately asserted that whatever we mean by the Trinity, it's three persons make up one God. So how are we to understand that? Well, the challenge begins in the modern world because we are thoroughly enlightenment people. No, don't doze off. Don't doze off. We are Newtonians. And like good Sir Isaac, we implicitly believe that <coughs> hard, solid stuff is the most real there is. To our common sense, Material substance is the basic building block, right down to those paper mache models of atoms that we used to make around the same time we were watching Schoolhouse Rock. And it's consequent of that common sense that we have difficulty imagining that anything could be more than one thing while at the same time being only one thing. Thing. When considering the nature of God, the challenge continues because we also use as an implicit analogy our sense of our own human self. I am the one and only me. And that is the surest and perhaps the only thing I can know in life. As Descartes said 400 years ago, I think, therefore I am. And by extension, we want to grant God's self at least the same individual integrity that we grant ourselves. And a God that is three, in addition to being one, well, it seems to compromise that. But in recent decades, both our science and our social experience have outpaced such old modes of thinking. We now know that those models of atoms, they were grossly inaccurate. That behind all solid substance is quivering, impossible to pin down energy that constantly shifts and constantly moves and we increasingly know that even the human self is not so singular and monolithic a thing as we used to think. Rather than old philosophical monism, philosophers and psychologists now use images of webs, or even more recently, networks, to describe the human self. So get this. Philosopher Kathleen Wallace says, quote, you, you are a network. You cannot be reduced to a body or a mind or a particular social role. It's not only embodiment, not only memory or consciousness of social relations, but the relations themselves that matter to who the self is. Wallace argues for a more relational, less container view of the self. Y'all are doing such a great job staying awake. So let me get to what does that mean then? Well, whereas we used to think of me as a singular thing, as a container, and all my relationships as things that merely touch or ping that container, 
The newer realization is that there's no unchanging container at all. There is no unalterable me in the center of my experience. Rather, myself, if we can even call it that, is the sum total of the network of relationships and identities that I experience in my life. In other words, I don't just have a relationship with my spouse, my kids, my friends, my coworkers, you. I am those relationships. Two illustrations that may help. First, a spider's web. What is the center of a spider's web? It's a hole. It's an empty place. There's not really a center at all. It's a void. The real parts of the web are the many gossamer strands that connect the web. Or if that doesn't work for you, try this. Consider an electrical arc. Those two solid nodes on either end, they're not the arc at all. They're nothing. The arc, the real thing, is that pulsing, moving electrical current between the nodes. And that's the network theory of the self. I am not a singular unchanging thing. I am the network of relationships of which my constantly morphing existence in the world consists. This makes perfect sense when we consider what it might be like to go back in time and to speak, for instance, to the me that sat in front of that television set in 1978. To what extent can we say that the two Barclays are even the same person? The social identities and relationships that have pulsed through me and recreated me a thousand times over the past five decades and that make up my dynamic self are anything but static, anything but sing singular, and yet somehow enduringly, I'm also still me. And that helps us skirt, at the very least, an understanding of the Trinity, the essence of God, the divine reality at the center of all that is, is not a singular thing, not solid and unchanging like those old atomic models. The essence of God is a network <laughs> of pulsing, dynamic relationships between what we call the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. As in those of us created in the image of God, in God's self, these three inform and interpenetrate and flow to and through each other, creating the one God make up, made up of three arcs, a flowing, moving love. Can you envision that? I know you experience it. The Father who creates you, the Son who redeems you, and the Holy Spirit who enlivens your faith in your life and at the end of the day, that's what matters more than any 13 and a half minute, minute explanation. In the end, I think maybe Schoolhouse Rock said it best. Somewhere in the ancient mystic trinity, you get three. There's a magic number. The past, the present, and the future. Faith, hope, and charity give you three. Amen.